you're sending an electronic message to a customer or potential customer, it is imperative under Canada's anti-spam legislation that you have either implied or expressed consent. The difference between the two is tremendous and operating under the understanding of implied consent when expressed is actually required could result in catastrophic fines for your business up to a million dollars. In today's video, as a business lawyer, I'm going to walk you through the differences between implied and express consent, again, under Canada's anti-spam legislation. If you're not already aware, this is a legislation that governs, among many things, any company sending out commercial electronic messages, again, to customers or potential customers, and this could include in the format of email or in the format of text message. This piece of legislation, as we've covered in another video, I'll link in the description box down below, is more or less about a decade old and active in the country of Canada. So in the ambit of all the laws and history that we have, that's a very short period of time, which means that the government still seeks out to make examples of whoever it catches and that there is sort of a strong watchdog community to ensure that individuals that are contacted are contacted only through appropriate means. Because it's also a big mess for the government to come and clean things up once somebody has been the victim of spam or fraud or all of the inappropriate sorts of conduct captured under CASEL is the short form, C-A-S-L, Canada's anti-spam legislation. For those of you that are new to the channel, my name is Pam Batani. I'm a business lawyer and the founder here at Grapheme Business Law, a law firm offering services virtually and throughout the province of Ontario, Canada, and working exclusively with business owners and entrepreneurs. If you're new to the YouTube channel, again, you're going to want to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe, okay? Most of you guys that watch these videos have not yet subscribed. So make sure you're a good one and you click on that subscribe button right now. Thank you. So as I mentioned, Castle covers two sorts of consent and I want to be very clear here. Anything said about consent on this video to me as a lawyer, it's hyper important to differentiate from the definition of consent in other areas of law, such as criminal law and other ambits of law. The concept of implied consent while relevant here is absolutely not relevant to certain other areas of the law so make sure you know what you're doing you govern yourself accordingly and you do not import any consent content from this video to any other area of law including you know mega disclaimer alert criminal law there's no such thing we don't imply consent in that area of the law okay this is anti-spam legislation and the language found in that act and that act tells us we're dealing with two kinds of potential consent, including implied and express. I'm going to start with express first because in some ways it's a lot less of a, it's a lot more formulaic, I should say. Okay. Express consent is when you don't have implied and we'll cover at the end of the video, how you have implied, video, uh, how you have implied consent. But if you don't have implied consent, you're going to go the express route, which is going to require you to have positive communication, opt in communication from that individual you are sending your commercial electronic message to. OK, silence does not constitute implied consent. You know, nothing constitutes implied consent other than an active opt in. And that is straight from government resources from the government of Canada. Express consent in terms of how you obtain it can be can be obtained verbally or in writing, okay? And in either case, the onus is on you as the business owner or entrepreneur sending out or communicating that question in a sense from your end to prove that you did obtain consent to the message you delivered. And again, whether verbally or in writing. An example of such a kind of message could be, and this is rough language, not telling you to copy it. I'm just giving an idea as to what could go into such a kind of message. Hello, my name is so and so or the company is so and so you identify yourself. I'm reaching to you in regards to this initiative or this product, this service, whatever the case may be. You make very clear who you are and why you've ended up in this person's phone or email or if it's verbally why your paths have crossed verbally. Okay. And you say, you know, I'd like to share more about this initiative or product or good or service with you, whatever the case may be. If you would like to hear more, please 
you know, confirm. And the confirmation method is up to you, the language you choose for that. But again, it needs to be a positive opt-in. So you can't trick people and say, if you, if you want to, if you don't want to hear more, reply stop. Otherwise, we'll assume that we're good to go here. No, you don't assume. You go for the express opt-in, okay? When it comes to the implied consent, I sort of save this for second half because it's a longer list. And in a way, that's a good thing that there are so many opportunities for you to operate under that implied consent. Implied consent, you're going to want to read the act carefully and work with the lawyer that helps you understand what you're reading. I don't advise anybody to go and tackle Castle on their own, but implied consent, there's a few circumstances that are outlined in section 10 of the act, okay? And, or, or of the legislation. And big picture, the two routes to implied consent, again, big picture, this isn't necessarily every scenario, but it's the most often occurring scenarios, are going to involve a current business relationship you have with that person or a current non-business relationship. And we'll talk about what on earth that means. When it comes to business relationships, it's important to understand that there is a timestamp on what constitutes business relationship, okay? For example, one thing that might constitute is if in the last two years, two calendar years, you as, an, as a company have sold or partaken in the transaction of land or real estate or something like that. You've sold this person something within that ambit of land or real estate. And um, if that applies to you, you are sort of assumed, you're sort of determined to having had the implied consent of this individual, although in communicating to them, you should still give them an option to opt out. It doesn't mean just because you two had a transaction sometime within the last two years that this person should be like forced to talk to you in perpetuity. In terms of exact language for business relationship, you're gonna see me, I'm gonna put it up on the screen here. An exacting business relationship, uh, an existing business relationship arises in the following cases. Where there's been a purchase or lease of a product, good service, land, or an interest or right in land within the previous two years, okay? Where the recipient accepts a business, investment, or gaming opportunity or engaged in the bartering of anything mentioned in subsection I, again, within the last two years where a written contract currently exists between the recipient and either the sender or the person or organization that caused or allowed the message um, has occurred within the last two years, or where an inquiry application was made by the recipient in respect of anything we've just read out loud within the last six months. So the big picture takeaway here is that with business relationships, we're looking at a two-year timeline of an actual transaction. If there's been no transaction, we're looking at a six-month timeline of inquiry pertaining to a transaction, okay? Like that person reached out to you and they wanted to go into business with you. It's a really careful slippery slope though, okay? Because this is an exact timeline from the date, dating back from the date to which you send out a message. So the onus is on you to be, be very clear with these timelines, which in reality is just not possible to do a lot of the time. So that takes us back to what? The first half of this video and the express consent, you know, requirements and guidelines, okay? Better to be safe than sorry. That's what a lot of platforms advocate for as well. Now there's a funny thing we mentioned and it was about a, a non-business relationship. And this one, again, I'll put the language this time directly from the act. Last time it was from a legal, um, from a large law firm's website, but this is directly from the act. Existing non-business relationship means a non-business relationship between the person to whom the message is sent and any other persons referred to in that subsection um, could be having that conversation arising from and now it's going to be big picture donations or gifts, volunteer work performed or memberships. You can pause the video to read the section word for word. Big picture there is something within the ambit of volunteering or membership or things like that. Again, that could get really fuzzy because is somebody really a member? Did they really volunteer? How long did they volunteer for? Things like that. So it is better to aim for express consent in that scenario as well. Although, of course, that puts more onus on you as a business owner or entrepreneur. And that could, as a business person, you know, aside from being a business lawyer, I understand that that could bottleneck your conversation as well. But at the end of the day, you're going to want to make sure you're having the most castle adherent version of your conversation possible to avoid, I mean, the stick that's over your head. That's a fine of up to a million dollars by the Canadian government. 
and um, you know there are a lot of resources out there that you could look into yourself as well in terms of the main reasons Canadians actually complain and file castle violations. I'll tell you right now the main reason they file is actually from being unclear as to the identity of the sender, okay? So identity and identifying yourself and your business is going to be something you pay special attention to. I will link down below, like I mentioned, the previous castle video we have on this channel. And because it's such an important topic, I'm actually going to link down below some of the resources I looked at in creating this video as well, so that you can read exactly what I read as a lawyer. And if you have any questions or comments, of course, you can post them down here on YouTube if they're more on the social or sharing with other business owners side. But if you have legal inquiries and you're at a stage now in your business when you'd like to send out these commercial electronic messages, we certainly have the knowledge and experience required to help you develop the language, to help you develop the contracts and agreements that are required for you to go into with a partner, for example, that might be sending out the messages on your behalf. You're going to want to make sure you're protected against that other party's actions. So our website is graphenebusinesslaw.ca. Our email is info at graphenebusinesslaw.ca. Let us know in the comments down below again if this video is helpful for you or if you'd like to learn more about Castle Canada's anti-spam legislation, which is a heavy hitting piece of legislation, fairly new to the market. And again, the government, you know, does try to make an example of the first offender, so to speak, so that it hopefully makes adherence easier for the generations to come. So I'll leave the video with that. And again, thank you so much for watching.